Hi everyone, this is Tom Donahoe from the UCLA School of Medicine, and I'm going to be talking about the patient's perspective for all of this today. So in the next 10 or 15 minutes, I'm at the end of this section, you'll be able to explain the basic concepts of Medicaid expansion and marketplaces, review the rights, responsibilities, and decisions of impacted consumers, not just at the end of this year, but into the next two years, and consider the decision-making process for impacted consumers through interactive cases. So hopefully at the end of this presentation, you'll be able to go home and have dinner and talk about the basics of the Affordable Care Act uh, and from the consumer's perspective. So this act has been law for the last couple years. It was signed into law in March of 2010. It eliminated uh, pre-existing condition exclusions. So starting January 1st, when you go and get new insurance in these marketplaces that you can sign up for October 1st, um, pre-existing conditions will no longer matter. It expand, expanded Medicaid to non-disabled adults with up to 138% of the federal poverty level, and we're going to talk about the federal poverty level, or FPL, more. It included subsidies to purchase insurance through these exchanges or marketplaces for people who make 100 to 400% of the federal poverty level. And then, most importantly, it expanded Medicaid and introduced these marketplaces um, that go into place January 1, 2014. So even though this is a, a, the biggest change in health care since Medicare in 1965, um, and it's coming up pretty soon, uh, people really don't uh, have some misperceptions about it and haven't heard a lot of it, especially the people who are most impacted. So if you look at as late as April 2013, this is uh, information from Kaiser's very interesting health tracking polls, if you want to look those up. Um, so as late as April 2013, you can see that 42% of people were unaware that the Affordable Care Act was still the law in the United States. 7% thought that the Supreme Court overturned it, 12% thought that Congress repealed it, and 23% just didn't know. And then if you ask as late as June, uh, 2013, what have people heard? For the group that were most concerned about, the uninsured who should be going to the marketplace or uh, the exchanges or getting Medicaid expansion in Medicaid expanding states, so uninsured people, what have they heard? You could see that only 4% said a lot. 8% um, said some, 32% only a little, and then most alarming, 55% said as late as June, nothing at all. So let's talk about the federal poverty level for a second. So that's uh, you're going to hear that throughout my section and other parts of the presentation because it really drives uh, whether you get Medicaid in a Medicaid expanding state or those people who need to go to the exchange in every state. So 100% of the federal poverty level for a family size of one individual, and my examples will be individuals to keep it simple, but you can see here the different uh, federal poverty levels for different family size. So 100% for an individual is $11,490. Now, an important number to remember is 138% of the federal poverty level, or in 2013, $15,856, because 138% of the federal poverty level, anyone who makes less than that, um, that or less than that, in a Medicaid-expanding state is going to get Medicaid. So if you're going to remember one slide from these 10 to 15 minutes, I would say remember this one. This is the one that's going to be able to have you explaining these concepts to um, a family member. So if we look here in Medicaid expanding states, if you make less than 138% of the federal poverty level, you're going to get Medicaid. And so for an individual, that's $15,856, like I mentioned. And you can see here for a household of four, that's $32,500. So if you're in a Medicaid expanding state, you make less than 138% of poverty, you're going to get Medicaid. Now, in all states where the exchanges exist, if you're between 100% and 400% of the federal poverty level, you qualify for um, immediate or deferred premium tax credits. What does that mean? That means uh, federal assistance with your monthly premium for health insurance, which we're going to talk a little bit more about in the coming slides. So if you make 100 to 400%, you get help with your monthly payment. You can take that help right away with a reduced monthly payment, or you can defer it until when you file taxes. And this is projected income we're talking about, remember. So you're projecting your income for 2014. Now, if you make between 100 and 250% of the federal poverty level, you'll also get cost-sharing subsidies. So what does that mean? That means that you'll get help at the point of service. So with the co your co-pays will be lower for drugs and for office visits, for example. Now, it's important to remember for these cost-sharing subsidies, you've got to be between 100% 250% of the federal poverty level and you need to be in the silver plan. 
So to get the subsidies, think Silver Plan. So if you can remember all of uh, this information from this slide, um, you're going to know a lot for the basics to have a discussion with the patient about how um, Medicaid expansion and the marketplaces will work. So let's go ahead and do a polling question. What is the penalty for someone who should have had health insurance in 2014 but didn't get it? So is it a tax penalty of $95 or 1%, whichever is greater, a tax penalty of $95 or 1%, whichever is smaller, there is no penalty the first year, or I don't know. So we'll give people a minute to vote. There's over 100 people who have already voted. OK, so let's close that. OK, great. So you can see 27% said a tax penalty of $95 or 1%, whichever is greater. And that's actually the correct answer. So thank you to the 43.8% who said you didn't know. But now everybody should know for an individual, if you didn't get insurance in 2014, and you should have, um, you're, and your 2015 taxes, you're going to pay a tax penalty of $95 or 1%, whichever is greater, when you file in, 20, your, in 2015 your 2014 taxes. Okay, so a tax penalty of $95 or 1%, whichever is greater. So this is what the phase-in of that tax penalty looks like over the next three years. So uh, when you're doing your, your 2014 taxes, which obviously you'll be doing in the year 2015, so for your 2014 taxes, it's 1% or $95, whichever is greater. Then it goes up to 2% or $325, whichever is greater in 2015. And then in 2016 and beyond, it goes to 2.5% or $695. So there's much more of an incentive to get insurance as the years go on. So patients who are new to insurance are going to have to learn some health insurance terminology that I think most of us are probably familiar with. And these are concepts like premium, how much you're going to pay each month for your insurance, deductible, how much per year you have to pay before your insurance kicks in, copay, like copayments for drugs or coinsurance, like if you have to pay 10% of an MRI, for example, your annual total out-of-pocket expenses, the most you have to pay each year, your premium or tax credit, that's the assistance you can get each month where the government helps pay a portion of your premium, or you can wait until the end of the year and, and get it as a tax credit if you make less than 400% of poverty. And then those cost-sharing subsidies I talked about in the silver plan for people making between 100 and 250% of poverty. So people are going to have to know this terminology, and they're also going to have to understand the concept that you're projecting income. So if you under project your income and you make more and you took the full subsidy, you're going to have to pay that back at tax time during a process called reconciliation. And they're also going to have to understand how the different plans work. So the qualified health plans throughout the country are defined by metal group. And so the platinum and the gold plan have no deductible. And they cover, on average, using actuarial assumptions between, for platinum, on average, 90% of the costs of, of someone's health care, gold 80%, so these are the, more, the two more expensive plans. And then silver covers 70% of, uh, on average, talking about large numbers of people, of um, health care costs. And so silver actually does have a deductible. It's $2,000, but it's a sliding deductible. So if you make... Uh, less than 250% of poverty, that, that deductible amount is going to go down. And we're going to see that through an example in a minute. And then finally, the bronze plan, which just covers 60% of costs um, averaged over all the people in the bronze plan. And people also need to understand a lot of the terminology I think we're used to using all the time, like what's the difference between a health maintenance organization where um, clinicians contract with an HMO and you've got to go to that network and maybe you can only go outside the network for emergency care, and a PPO, a preferred provider organization where you can go to anyone in that provider network or pay more to go outside of the provider network, or an EPO like here at UCLA, we use Anthem EPO because we're an exclusive group of providers within the UCLA organization. So let's talk a little bit about ACA and immigrants. We know that um, immigrants have much higher rates of TB. And so if we look at the two places where um, if immigrants, you know, in terms of exchanges or marketplace and also in terms of uh, um, going to Medicaid expansion, you can see that exchanges all lawfully present immigrant residents, including even those, this is a special case for immigrants, where if they make less than 100% of the federal poverty level, they can also get subsidies and uh, tax credits in the marketplace. So all lawfully present 
immigrant residents are eligible for health, health care reform subsidies, so those premium tax credits and cost sharing reductions that I've talked about. Now, undocumented, undocumented immigrants, unfortunately, including children and pregnant women, are not eligible for these subsidies or even the full-priced health insurance plans in the exchange or marketplace. Now, in terms of Medicaid expansion eligibility, uh, most lawfully present residents must wait five years for federal Medicaid unless the state picks up federal options for those under 18 or pregnant or has some sort of other state-funded programs. Uh, refugees, survivors of trafficking, and other humanitarian groups are federally eligible with no wait. So undocumented immigrants are only eligible for emergency Medicaid and in some states prenatal services. Now this is important because in 2011 it's important to think about the Affordable Care Act and immigrants because in 2011 a total of 62 percent of the cases of TB cases in the United States occurred in foreign-born persons. So many of them were undocumented. So the TB case rate among foreign-born persons was approximately 11 and a half times higher in that year, 2011, than among U.S.-born persons. So it's really important to remember how the Affordable Care Act uh, impacts immigrants when you're talking about TB. So let's go to a case. Pedro is a 28-year-old phone sales representative who estimates he, who estimates he will make $12,065 in 2014. So that's 105% of the federal poverty level. He lives and receives his medical care <clears throat> excuse me, at a health department clinic serving the uninsured. He lives in a state that is not expanding Medicaid, and he's lawfully present. So let's just say Pedro live, was born here. So he's lawfully present, he lives in a state that is not expanding Medicaid, and he makes 105% of the federal poverty level. So let me ask you a question. Under the Affordable Care Act, will Pedro be required to purchase a health insurance policy or pay a penalty? So yes. No, he qualifies for Medicaid. Yes, but he will get help with his insurance payments and co-pays, or I'm not sure. So go ahead and vote. And we already have 100 people, so I'll go ahead and show the results. Okay, so the people that said yes, you're right. So um, more than, well more than half the people got the right answer. So the right answer is yes, but I think the most correct answer is yes, but he will also get help with his insurance payments and co-pays. Because remember, he, he just barely makes over 100% of poverty. His state is not expanding Medicaid, so he's going to get a lot of help and have very low, well, relatively low payments and um, co-payments. So let's look at another case of Dwayne. So Dwayne is a 40-year-old construction worker who estimates that in 2014 he's going to make $19,000, or 165% of the federal poverty level. He was born in and receives his medical care at a county health department clinic in Los Angeles, California. So he lives in a Medicaid-expanding state, California. He was born there, so he's lawfully present. Um, and he's getting his medical care at a county health department, but he, he, he thinks he'll make $19,000 in 2014, and so um, let me ask you a question about him. Under the Affordable Care Act, will Duane be required to purchase health insurance or pay a penalty? So the first response is yes. Second response again is no, he qualifies for Medicaid. Third is yes, but he'll get help with his insurance payments and co-pays, or fourth, I'm not sure. So go ahead and take a minute to vote. Your quick voters out there. So I will wait until we get to 100. Okay, so we're over 100. Let's see what you said. Okay, so again, people overwhelmingly have the correct answer, which is yes. Um, but probably the more important thing is yes, but he'll get significant help with his insurance payments and co-pays because he um, makes uh, less than 400% of the federal poverty level. So uh, in California, we heard earlier that our uh, state exchange is called Covered California. The website is coveredca.com. I underline .com because it's important to remember that this is private insurance. It's not government or even nonprofit per se. It is private insurance marketplace where people go up and sign, for, sign up for plans. And so this is what the Covered California website looks like. You can actually, this is a, a, a shot of the screen that I took uh, about a year ago for our border project. And so um, I wanted to emphasize here that it's only um, 38 days as of today and, until the Covered California Marketplace opens October 1st, along with all the other marketplaces across the country. So you can go there right now, though, today, and, and look up this cost estimator calculator. And people can go ahead and put in um, 
their income and get back for their family size what uh, a premium on average would cost them. So you can go and do that today. So looking back at Dwayne, remember he makes $19,000 a year. If he had chosen the silver plan where he's going to get lower co-pays and a lower deductible, um, you can see what this would mean for him. So if he chose the silver plan with $19,000 a year, the calculator would show that his premium would cost $294 a month. But he'd only have to pay 75 if he took the immediate uh, tax credit. So you can see significant help with him uh, with his payment because he only makes $19,000 a year. And you can see his co-pays would be relatively lower, only $5 for a co-pay for drugs. And his deductible would go down from $2,000 to $500. And he would have a lower out-of-pocket maximum, only $2,250 per year. That would be the most he'd ever have to pay in any given year, no matter how sick he got. So given that, if you could take a moment to think, he makes $19,000 a year, and he'd have to pay $75 a month or pay, face a penalty of 1% or $95. So 1% of his income is $190. So this Dwayne's decision uh, next, well, actually coming in October would be, do I take insurance with $75 a month and these different co-pays or pay the $190 penalty when I file my taxes next year? So I'm going to ask you your opinion. So in your opinion, do you think Dwayne will sign up for health insurance in covered California during the open enrollment period, which is October 1st through March 31st? Or do you think he's going to pay the penalty when he files his taxes? So in 2015, when he files his 2014 taxes, he'd pay the penalty. So what do you think he'd do? He makes $19,000 a year. And we can go back and see those were what his different, um, what his premium and his co-pays would be. So go ahead and answer here. First one is I think he'll sign up for affordable health insurance during open enrollment. I think he'll pay the tax penalty in the first year. I'm undecided. I can see both equally. Um, I just still don't know. So go ahead and just give me your opinion, and we'll stop the voting at 100. Oh, quick voters, so we're already over 100. Oh, okay. So. The majority of people think that he'd pay the tax penalty the first year. And I have to say, I've been teaching this both at UCLA and the community in Los Angeles and using audience response even in the live in-person sessions. And I, most of the clinicians and community groups I have presented to agree with you. They think that just knowing this little bit that we know about Dwayne, given the choices, that a lot of people think he would choose the penalty. Now, for those of you that think he would sign up for affordable health insurance, that's absolutely possible, too. I mean, he could suffer from back problems or have other reasons for him wanting to sign up. But I think most people's gut reaction is, given the choices, the first year, some people will opt for paying the penalty. But remember, that's going to increase in coming years. And so it's much more likely that more people in the coming years would go for number one, taking the affordable health insurance, because the penalty is going to be higher. So finally, let's look at a case of Tanya. So Tanya is a single 52-year-old hotel worker who was born and living in South Los Angeles. She thinks she will make uh, $21,027 in 2014, so that's 183% of the federal poverty level. Um, and she currently has no health insurance. She says that she always wanted it but could never afford rates for someone my age. She has not seen a doctor for years. Uh, sometimes she goes to an urgent care clinic to get antibiotics. She really wants health insurance um, now, especially as she just inherited a home from her parents and worries that just one visit to the emergency room or the hospital could bankrupt her or cause her to lose her home. She's had a cough recently, but she thinks she's in pretty good health. So she's someone who wants insurance. She's 52 years old. She works in a hotel in South Los Angeles, um, and she's afraid of losing her home. So remember, for the new insurance uh, marketplaces or for Medicaid expansion, uh, assets don't matter. So here's someone who's uh, really motivated to get insurance and will, will have an offer of um, affordable insurance in the exchanges. So the other thing about Tanya is that she doesn't know that she's living with latent TB infection. So let's think about <clears throat> all of that situation for Tanya. And I'm going to ask you a question. So Tanya signs up and chooses a qualified health plan and a primary care provider in Covered California. Do you think she will be evaluated for TB as part of her routine care with her provider at her first visit in 2014? So she signs up, she gets insurance, she chooses a plan, she signs up with a primary care provider, she goes there for her first visit. Do you think she's going to be evaluated for TB? And let's just say she still has that cough. So yes, no, or I'm not sure. Okay, so we got almost 100. Okay, over 100. Go ahead and post those. 
Okay, so I think I would agree with you too. And I, I presented these these types of cases to hepatitis and HIV providers, and they said largely the same thing that you know even though there's CDC guidance, for example, for testing baby boomers for Hep C, and there's certainly CDC and U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Um, guidance and even a grade A recommendation from them that makes it billable. Most providers uh, that you go to at some of, at qualified health plans like these these insurance plans, it's not part of routine standard care. So this is a role for the TB advocates and the TB community to take with the qualified health plans, not just in California but around the country. And it's something we're actually learning in the HIV world um, from TB because they've sort of taken the initiative here. So if you look in the resources section of the webinar, you'll find three documents. And those documents are letters that the TB advocacy community um, health department officers and others have written to Covered California to make the case for TB care and especially for no co-payment for TB screening. So that's the end of my presentation and thank you so much. Um, and once again, do go to the document section of the webinar and look at those letters to Covered California from the TB community.